Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, and sorry, happy sorry. Day. sorry, Kiara, hold on, I haven't started. <laughs> okay, no, it's okay. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the room filling up. Um, and once it stops filling up, you can start. Okay, sure. Um, how many um, attendees are we expecting? 71. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Women's Month. Welcome to this webinar on the value of female leadership in science and public health. Proudly brought to you by UKZN's College of Health Sciences. I'm Kiara Govinder, a final year medical student, and I'm honored to serve as facilitator of this discussion with a dynamic group of UKZN alumni and medical students who are well known for their exemplary leadership, selfless service, and intellectual prowess. Our distinguished panel consists of Dr. Dr. Tumisang Maliete, Dr. Ashik Pramchand, Ms. Ravona Haricharan, Ms. Toliswa Njapa, Mr. Yanga Mbele, and Mr. Vanna Chelan. Now, each of our speakers has quite a long CV, so in the interest of time, I'll highlight only a few notable leadership roles, achievements, and accolades. So Dr. Malete is a senior medical intern at Kalafong Hospital. He founded UKZN's Physician Society and served as an academic mentor and MCRC Secretary General. He was voted as one of UKZN's top 40 most inspiring students for two consecutive years and authored the book, Leading in a Selfie Generation. Dr. Pram Chand is a junior medical intern at King Edward Hospital. He is the founder of Broca, a Caprisa Research Fellow and former research director for SAMHSA. He has publications with Pulse Magazine, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and the Harvard Medical Student Review Journal. He is also the author of the book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey, Tales and Adventures in Medical School. Ms. Hari Charan is a final year medical student with a master's degree in medical sciences. She is the current chairperson of the Masterminds, which is the Dean's clinical research team, a member of the South African Neuroscience Society, and a research fellow at Caprisa. She has traveled to France to gain further insight into the field of neuroscience and is well published on the topic. She is also actively involved in cancer awareness and community education through the Woodview Cancer Support Group. Ms. Njapa is a final year medical student. She has previously served as MCRC Student Support Services Officer and SASCO Deputy Chairperson. She is the co-founder of the I Made a Doctor fundraising campaign, which has been vital in preventing financial exclusion of students with historical debt. Mr. Mbele is a final year medical student and representative of the class of 2022. He has previously served as deputy chairperson of the EFF Student Command. He was voted as the best fifth year medical student by his colleagues for his embodiment of the UKZN REACH principles. And last but not least, Ms. Tavana Chelan. She is a final year medical student. She has served as national chairperson of SAMHSA and is currently the vice chairperson of the Masterminds. Her work as a mentor and student activist has garnered international recognition at the Global Outstanding Leadership Awards and Health Excellence Awards. This webinar is yet um, another one of her student empowerment initiatives organized on behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of College of Health Sciences, Professor Busi Siwe Nkama. Savannah will now formally welcome you all and explain the purpose and significance of this talk. Thank you so much for that um, very um, warm introduction, Kiara. Um, ladies, embodiments of love, um, I would love to formally welcome you to today's webinar on behalf of the College of Health Sciences and um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Prof. Nkama, 
I welcome you to today's webinar on the value of female leadership in science and health. When we think about leadership, um, dear embodiments of love, it is so important for us to understand the role that this leadership plays, not just in the confines of our career, the confines of this degree, but carrying forward that leadership qualities into our everyday life, our everyday interactions, our simple interactions with our family, our friends, our colleagues, the so-called informal interactions. If we look at some of the subtopics that we are actually going to be discussing today, in terms of the value of integrating spirituality um, with our university degrees, with medicine, and how that actually links to us being a leader, it allows us to have this opportunity to really reflect, to reflect on how much we invest our purpose into everything that we do, into our career, our academics, our health, wellness. Because ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that our career does take up a large amount of our time and our journey. So whether you're a doctor or a teacher or even a lawyer, it means that you are engaging with clients, with patients, with students on an everyday basis. And it is that students or you know that patient's mental well-being that is ultimately dependent on what you impart to them, how they live their everyday life, the quality of that patient's life, of that student's development in the classroom is dependent on what you invest. So it's not just theoretical learning, it's not just about um, you know, our degree on paper, it is about the human touch and how much we are truly able to invest into our people. And um, on that note, I will hand over to Kiara so that she can formally kickstart this panel discussion. A very warm welcome to all of you and to our panelists. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to have you on board today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tavana. Um, so before we proceed with the discussion, I'd like to encourage all attendees to participate. You can post your questions and comments in the chat section, and I'll read these during the Q&A session at the end. Um, you will also be provided with an opportunity to um, unmute yourself and directly engage with the panel during that session. OK, so let's um, kick off the conversation with Tavana. So we know that leadership is one of the six core competencies of any healthcare practitioner. Tell us, where does leadership come from? Hi, everyone. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with our first question, which is where does leadership come from? OK, so let's just take a minute to reflect, right? The short answer is leadership comes from within. Okay, so let's take it one step further. What really influences that which is within? <laughs> Number one, our thoughts. Everything that we see, that we hear, has an impact on our thoughts, right? So this is actually why social media has such a profound influence on us. Right? So it's so it's absolutely integral that we have control over the content that we engage with. Right? So if we allow ourselves to engage with negativity or any harsh content, you know, when you're scrolling Instagram or Facebook or looking at statuses on WhatsApp, that energy is being is being transmitted to us. All right. Secondly, our actions, our actions, what really dictates our actions, everything that we do, what dictates this action? Right, that's correct, our thoughts. So our thoughts dictate our actions. However, whether we act on our thoughts is entirely guided by our own moral and belief systems, right? So simply put, leadership is a consistent flow of selfless thoughts that is then acted upon due to our own character, which is our moral and our belief system. But, right, in terms of this leadership, we also need to acknowledge, is our desire to be a leader or is our desire to serve, 
to help, to uplift, to motivate, to be the best that we can be. Because true leadership isn't the ambition to be a leader, but it is the desire to serve and uplift that makes you a leader. Thank you so much. I'm now gonna hand over back to Kiara. That was very profound, Tavana. Um, so Dr. Pramchand, you've explored the world of public health research through Caprisa and have spearheaded many community health outreach projects for SAMHSA. From your experience, what is the role of leadership in public health? Mm, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kiara. It's, I'm glad to be here as well. And it's such an honor to discuss this topic, which has been a source of internal debate for me for some time. During my time in medical school, I felt that many of my community-led initiatives were, were attempts at taking whatever opportunity I could to, to help others. I think that it starts by, I had to ask myself what leadership meant to me first when trying to understand why I did what I did and what led me to make those decisions in medical school that um, that I'm glad to see have helped quite a few people. Uh, the concept of leadership is as old as, as the origin of the human race. And it's a, it's a pretty broad topic and trying to grapple with that does take a fair deal of, of introspection. I think the Canadian Journal of Public Health um, contextualized it quite well when they define that the leadership, especially in the public health context is related to the ability of an individual to influence, motivate, and enable others to contribute towards the effectiveness and success of the community and the organizations in which they work. So this involves inspiring other people and helping others craft their own futures, visions, and goals. Um, so in order, to, through my experiences, I found that leaders are not always individuals and they play many roles within the society. For example, if I think of, of my time in medical school, many of the leaders I encountered were not any single individuals. They were organizations or movements that exerted advocacy over communities. Uh, that included um, SAMHSA, Broca was just one of which I played a, a a role in, in, in initiating um, the Habitats for Humanity, which helped build um, low, would develop RDP housing for citizens in the Umga Baba community. And I had a small hand in that as well. And through my interactions, with all of them, I formed a more solid understanding of what role leadership plays in public health. We first and foremost, the leaders in public health represent the core values of the discipline, and that includes a desire to innovate and do good for human, humanity and to promote cultural and moral credibility of our work. When you see a leader, the first of all, that's somebody who, who you aspire to be, somebody who is moving you forward. So that's one of the reasons to inspire others. Uh, the other aspect is to, is, to, is to sow cohesiveness within society. Because, I mean, when you consider the vast combination of socioeconomic factors that, that divide us from uh, aging populations and workforces, globalization, consumerism, individualism itself as well. You, you need somebody to unite all of us under a common banner. And those are the leaders. The leaders who play that role are no less significant, um, whether as individuals or as, as groups. Uh, thirdly, I think that it's important for public health leaders to promote collaboration and networking, which is something that I'm grateful I had the chance to do with many of my medical school colleagues and whom I still maintain this, this connection through discussions such as this. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's the third point, to promote collaboration and networking. Um, and in a more collaborative world, we need innovation, which is probably my fourth point there. The, the, the significant role of a leader in public health is to innovate and to find new ways of doing things, to break ground that in ways that, that haven't been done before. 
which is something that I grappled a lot with as well in medical school. I thought to myself, you know what, why isn't this here? And why are there so many barriers to establish this? If I slowly break down the barrier, the fact that I, that I did it already sets precedent for anybody else who follows. I mean, I wanted to write, a, one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book in medical school is because I thought there aren't many people so far who I know who've told the story of the medical student experience. And I felt that if I started that off, there'd be a lot of others who'd be willing to share their stories and thus um, elucidate exactly um, what our experience is like. Today, so to, to, to reach the denouement of that point, I think that today the particular type of leadership that is required is not of a traditional command and control variety, but it's more adaptive. Um, you, you, when you combine all of these skills, you need somebody to unite us all, especially in a field which is ambiguous and unpredictable. And medicine is often like that. The leadership comes from, from many people in situations where there's often no clear path ahead, whether that's writing a book or um, publishing for somebody who has never published before, or, or, or if you're making a decision about whether to give a certain cocktail of medications to a patient when no guidelines on the topic exist. So that's probably the fifth point. Um, and one of, the, one of the fifth tenets that I, that, I, that I think I'll conclude with is that you have that leaders break new ground and also help us make decisions, especially in areas where there's great ambiguity. And the COVID-19 pandemic was a fine example of that. So to conclude about the, the role of, um, of, of leadership in public health, I think besides those five points that I mentioned, it's that it is a demanding task that needs, is needed more today than ever before when there are more factors than ever that could divide us. Um, it needs not just people, but organizations working together. And for a leadership to be effect effective, it must be built on a solid foundation consisting of a clear mission, a vision for the future, and a specific strategy, as well as a culture conducive to success. And that's why I think um, panel discussions like this help, because it promotes that kind of culture of leadership. And hopefully, um, with that, we can effectively realize those roles and turn them into realizations. Thank you, Dr. Pramchand. I couldn't agree anymore. Um, Dr. Malete, you've written a book on impactful leadership in the contemporary generation. What do you think is the value of integrating lead spirituality sorry, with leadership? Evening, everyone, um, and thank you for, for the opportunity. I think this is quite um, an interesting topic because whenever you look at leadership, I think we've we have a pretty good idea of what leadership is, is all about. But now when you now start integrating it with spirituality, you have to ask yourself, what is the definition of spirituality? And if you uh, do a quick search, you'd realize there's quite a number of definitions of what spirituality is, ab is about from various dictionaries and as well as various papers in psychology. However, one of the common themes that one finds whenever you look at what spirituality is actually about is that you realize that it's one is defined as an interconnectedness, one with the, the 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 individuals or others, or the environment that we that you're you're in, and the second big theme that you find whenever you think about spirituality is that it's a belief of something greater than yourself as an individual. There's something more out there than you as an individual. However, what one needs to always remember, I think, whenever the words spirituality comes out the first thing that we think about is religion and what what I found interesting is that spirituality does not always equate to to religion it may form part of the broader concept of religion however it does not always equate in religion and whenever you think about integrating it integrating it with leadership you realize that one spirituality will always come with various principles and whenever you look at those principles those principles will influence you as a leader in the way you lead yourself and secondly how you lead others and as mentioned earlier on that whenever you look at the definition of spirituality is that belief that there is something more there's something greater and that actually allows you as a, a leader to instill that principle within within the people you lead within you as an individual that there is actually more 
than just the work that you do. It brings a, a, a sense of significance in the type of work that you do. Because the reality is that you will encounter a lot of people um, whenever you are a leader. And or various, we encounter various individuals on a daily and they have various beliefs. And I think whenever you, you, need, you need to understand people from different areas, uh, from different perspectives, whether from a spiritual pers perspective, physical perspective, psychological perspective. However, the reality is that there will be spiritual values. And I think the big thing is that the value in integrating spirituality and leadership is that you actually start to see individuals holistically and you actually start to see people as whole individuals and you start to question what actually, what do, what, what can I learn from this individual? What, what, what can I learn and how do I connect um, to this? How, how do I connect to this individual? And I think, like I said, I just want to leave you with a few ideas and also just start a conversation. And I think in, in, in closing, I think by integrating spirituality and leadership is that you allow a breeding ground for um, servant leadership. You also allow for more significant impact and that you actually allow that opportunity to bring more meaning um, in, into work. And fourthly, it's to understand that not all spirituality um, equates to religion, but all religion has some form of spirituality. Thank you. Yeah, so investing in our spirit, our own spiritual well-being better helps us to connect with our colleagues and other members of society and to also um, collaborate in a meaningful manner to bring about effective, positive change, um, the change that we want to see in the world. And uh, as healthcare uh, practitioners, it also enables us to provide um, holistic health care for each one of our patients, you know, to see them as a person, an individual, a whole individual, and not just um, a disease in front of us. So thank you, Dr. Malete. That was very um, thought provoking. So let's move on to you, Ravona. Um, you've gained an impressive amount of experience in academia. Does an education in human values um, go hand in hand with a university degree? Good evening to everyone present. Today, I have the privilege of discussing that topic. Uh, human values are the internal virtues or beliefs that define what we believe in and guide our interactions in the world. There are numerous human values, but today I would like to discuss how we can use them to bring about a transformative change in our lives. To determine this, we must firstly understand where human values originate from. Each of our human values are as unique as a thumbprint and can be subjective. They are shaped by our interactions with our family, friends, colleagues, and experiences, with each value usually being inherently associated with a personal story. For example, if I told you to think about the word kindness, it will have different connotations and a core memory for each one of us. While we may differ in how and what shapes our human values, we can all agree that they add benefit to our lives. They are the pillars around which our lives and our behavior develops. According to the legendary peak performance coach, Robin Sharma, human values can be categorized under the following four domains, mindset, heart set, soul set, and health set. He goes on to describe these domains as being the foundation of the true primal power that resides within each one of us. As human beings, emphasis should be placed on developing each of these four domains. The mindset domain encompasses human values such as integrity, truth, humility, and personal growth. The heart set domain encompasses values like love, passion, kindness, compassion, generosity, and our social network, which includes our family, friends, and colleagues. The soul set encompasses our spirituality, happiness, gratitude, appreciation, and peace. The health set focuses on health, energy, and vitality. When these four domains are balanced, a person has the ability to become the greatest version of themselves and unlock their highest potential. Being a woman in university highlights that we share common traits such as being young, ambitious, goal-directed, and career-orientated. So the question remains, do these human values fit in with being a student or an academic? 
Undertaking a degree tends to place more focus on the mindset than the other domain than the other domains. However, I believe that every interaction that we have is a chance for us to implement all of our human values. Within the, within the heart set domain, love and passion should not exclusively be limited to the romantic relations in our lives. There should be love and passion towards our families, friends, communities, occupations, interests, and our lives as a whole. Displaying kindness and compassion, especially at work, has always been a top priority of mine personally. Being a medical student and soon-to-be doctor has taught me humility. Patients rely entirely on the medical system and they come to us often at one of the lowest points in their lives and are completely vulnerable to the level of care we show them. It is at this point that I know that being empathetic and going the extra mile in little ways can provide brief moments of relief to their angst. We need to learn how to nourish our hearts, body, souls, and our minds too. In order to employ the soul set values into your life, one should expand their spirituality. Employing prayer, appreciation, and gratitude in your life costs you nothing but it makes you rich, rich in peace and happiness. Many women should embrace practices such as yoga, meditation, and mindfulness to strengthen their spirituality. To improve your health set domain, it is essential to prime your cognition, energy, and body. Recently, I have noticed that there has been a shift towards women valuing their health and vitality, which is exceptional. Achieving optimal health is true wealth and allows you to have the energy to create the life that you want. So again, the question remains, are these domains of human values aligned with the university degree? My response is a firm yes, especially for women. Having a university degree fueled by positive human values provides you with the platform to empower other women. It gives you the opportunity to share your voice and allows you to become a role model to others. It enables you to impart the knowledge that you have and drives you to be a leader in your own community. To me, I believe that the key to improving and to improving and incorporating human values into our lives is through awareness. If we are more aware and cognizant of our interactions with the world and our reactions, we will be able to incorporate human values into each and every situation. We should strive not only to be great at our degrees or occupations, but strive to embody greater human values. You are not defined by your title or degree, but by your human values and the impact that you leave in the world. Human values assist you in succeeding at life and will allow you to build a luminous legacy that will enrich humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Ravona. Um, that's definitely something that needs to be reiterated um, to the student population. You know, you're not defined by this degree. You're going to be judged by your morals, um, your principles, you know, and how you actually apply this in your daily interactions. So, um, Toliswa, you're no doubt a role model to young women who are determined to be catalysts of positive change in their communities. Who are the female leaders you've always drawn inspiration from? Um, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity, firstly. Um, I'm so happy to be here and most importantly, discussing this topic. Um, so one of the females who I draw inspiration from was actually in medical school recently, um, Zuma. So this woman is an element of change, if I may put it like that. So this woman is not scared to um, say what she, she, she's not scared to speak her mind or say what she believes in. So these are the core things that are very much important in, in leadership. So I'd like to say this, um, um, there's this say by, uh, uh, there's this say by Mother Teresa, I'm sorry, 
So it says, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the water to create many ripples. So by this, she means that not her alone, she can change the entire world by step by, but step by step, she can do a couple of things that um, would require other women to continue or other people to continue into changing the world. So we need to understand that you alone cannot change the world, but the smallest bits that you play can change the world. So Rivona has spoken a lot of things that I was going to speak about. So it goes back to the values um, that you have as a human being. Uh, the degree that you're doing or what you're doing or the title that you're holding doesn't define who you are. So you need to know first as a leader who you are and what are your values. So this woman I have mentioned earlier, she knows who she is and she knows her values. So it goes back to those minor things that we overlook. So you may think that a leader is someone who does these big things, but it just goes back to who you are and what you believe in and your values. So as um, one of the panelists has mentioned that a leader is not an individual. So if you are to look at it, they make, it's because, um, I'm sorry, it's because you alone cannot do everything all by yourself. So a leader is someone who is able to integrate these complex things into one. So a leadership, leadership is, an for, is a forever um, complex or forever evolving or changing journey. So there's nothing basically that is cast into stone that says um, a leader is this particular person. So I'm also very much um, into women empowerment. I like to empower women. So I once had this conversation with one of my colleagues asking what is woman empowerment? So basically from my own words is that woman empowerment is like um, being empowering women to be able to take their own decision for personal development and social development. So it's equipping women to say that you can do this particular thing on your own. You can do this thing um, um, for, for yourself, if I put it like that. So it's a very important thing. It's very important that we get female leaders because now we are in shortage of female leaders. If you are to ask other people that say, no, but this will disrupt my personal life. This is a dream I'd like to have. And people are not willing to, well, sacrifice a couple of things because being a leader, you have to sacrifice a couple of things. You have to be good at also time management. So these are the things that we are failing to do. And I hope that someday we do have these women who are able to take this journey that other women have created or have started so that in the end, we come up as a better, better world in the end. I believe that we are also um, the, the, the generation of having a female president. That's what I believe in. And it's because of the women that are up, that are up growing or the women that are upcoming, the leadership that we are seeing is quite strong women. They're very strong women. So also leadership is something that comes from within. It's not something that um, you can do anyhow. It's something that, there's something that tells you that you have a purpose here. It's something that says, that comes from within that says you have a purpose. If you don't do this, then who else is going to do these things? So these are minor important things that we need to look into. And I hope that maybe someday we'll be able to have a female president. And I hope that someday we'll be able to empower more women to do um, different things because this is a journey. This is a forever changing journey. And we need more women into women leadership. So by the virtue also of being in this degree, you're already an, a, a leader. So you need to be well established. You need to understand your core values. You need to know who you are. Because without knowing who you are, then you'll be leading people into um, an uncertain place. So it will be like you're driving a ship or yes, you're driving a ship without a map. So basically these are the important things and these are the core building or the minor building blocks in which other women need to look up to. And yeah, basically that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, yeah, so definitely a female president is something that I'd love to see in my lifetime. Um, indeed, Women's Month is a time to highlight and celebrate um, the many contributions that women have made to society, culture, and history. But it is also an important time to advance the discourse on gender-based violence, a disease that continues to plague South African society, violating human rights, um, contributing greatly to public health problems. Like all diseases, we know that prevention is better than cure. Therefore, as healthcare practitioners, it's our duty to society to maintain an active role in aggressively tackling the root causes of the social ill. Yanga, you are a champion of activism against gender-based violence. How do we get more young men involved in turning the tide on this culture of interpersonal violence? Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's such a um, wonderful opportunity to be able to speak on such a great platform and to be able to engage on such um, an essential topic. Uh, so my topic is basically the importance of male uh, role models in the prevention of gender-based violence. Um, as you've said, uh, gender-based violence is a pandemic which has affected our society and particularly this country as a uh, whole. And uh, through the COVID pandemic, we actually got to see the extent and the severity of uh, gender-based violence uh, in this country. Um, so let me just start by defining what gender-based violence is. So gender-based violence is harmful acts directed at an individual based on their gender. It's rooted on inequality of power, particularly when it comes to a relationship. And it is, uh, it affects women disproportionately, mainly because of the inequality when it comes to power within a relationship. And also because of the societal norms that have been built around. It's a serious offense towards a violation of human rights and contributes towards a lot of issues that we've seen in uh, public health, such as uh, sexual assault, and also such as uh, violence uh, in itself. And it causes uh, a lot of damage to our society. So it's estimated by WHA, by WHO that uh, more than one third of women at least experience uh, sexual or physical violence in their lifetime. So through my experience at, when I was doing my rural block rotation in Msing, I was able to see, we actually do discuss the issue of how rampant gender-based violence is in this country, but um, through working um, at the casualty there, I was able to see hands on how uh, the extent of GPV is in this country, uh, especially because on a daily basis, there was always a case which was related to gender-based violence. And that worried me to see um, that it's actually so rampant, it's actually so common, it's so prevalent within our country, because we always discuss it, but I think up until you actually get to see uh, it, uh, then um, you never really are prepared for like how much uh, it actually does impact us as a society and how prevalent it actually is. Um, so like, like you've mentioned, Kiara, gender-based violence is preventable and it is better for us to prevent uh, rather than cure. So we should be aggressively and relentlessly try to fight uh, gender-based violence as a society, especially us as men, because we play a pivotal role um, in prevention of gender-based violence. And one of the essential ways to do this is to try and break the cycle through having upstanding role models which can shape the next generation of men. Uh, so it's also important uh, to recognize the fact that gender-based violence is um, it's almost like a perpetual cycle 
where people that were previously victims actually end up becoming perpetrators. So it's essential from a young age to create a safe space for children um, from home. If you are a role model, because most of us by this time, we actually uh, fit the criteria per se of being a role model because we are in this transition of actually becoming doctors and everyone within uh, society is basically looking at us uh, within our communities that we go back to at home, they're looking at us uh, as uh, leaders. So we should try and create uh, an environment which is safe uh, for children, especially for male children to teach them from a young age uh, to break particular uh, stereotypes and particular norms that perpetuate um, sexism, that perpetuate discrimination, um, and to also encourage them to have um, to say like uh, productive and safe relationships with other people to be um, aware of issues that are uh, such as gender-based violence that there are within uh, society to, all, to teach them from a very young age um, that, uh, that we should by all means try and protect uh, those that are so our fellow females as well as uh, our sisters as well, our mothers. Uh, so it should be from a young age that we should be uh, teaching our, our boys, which will actually grow into men. Uh, so it's also important to uh, form a closer uh, connection with boys from the beginning, like I said, and to also form like a mentorship with them to be able to teach them uh, to break away from particular norms which were accepted uh, within society, such as if you're in a relationship and if you're involved in an argument with your partner, that you should um, use uh, physical force or violence to exert whatever you need to exert. So we should teach them that there are effective ways to communicate within a relationship and you do not need to exert uh, violence and you do not need to exert force in order for you to be able to communicate effectively. And part of that is to also teach um, the issue, the concept of consent so that um, from a young age, um, so from boys which then transition into uh, men, to be able to know what is consent and to be able to understand uh, what is consent. Um, so that when they are mature enough to be engaging in sexual activity so that they know um, that um, if they're involved in a sexual relationship with their partner and their partner says no, that they should be able to accept that and that, that it's actually fine for their partner to say no and uh, once your partner says no, that you should accept that. And to also break away from other uh, toxic uh, masculinity norms, such as uh, um, the ones that people engage in, that uh, in parties, for example, if um, let's say um, you're in a party and you've uh, uh, bought alcohol for female, that there's a particular expectation um, that that favor should be returned uh, through a sexual interaction. So we should break away from that and also break away from um, things uh, by informing uh, these young men that if someone is under the influence of alcohol, that they cannot consent to a sexual uh, interaction so uh, and also to be able to protect those that are vulnerable if you're in such a, a space where someone is under the influence of alcohol and someone is trying to coerce them into uh, sexual relations so those are the things that we should be able to teach these young men which are transitioning into uh, basically becoming uh, yeah men uh, and then, um, as we know, we're basically 
getting into the fourth industrial revolution where things have changed and the power of social media is growing and worldwide we can actually see the massive impact that social media has on uh, society as a whole so we should strive to have um, a committed and, and inclusive storytelling that does not uh, perpetuate harmful gender stereotypes um, for example uh, currently we've actually had a problem where we had a very controversial and influential uh, figure on social media, which is Andrew Tate, who touted and spewed a lot of um, gender stereotypes and actually perpetuated violence on social media. And we actually saw that there's a void where young men follow um, someone who perpetuates uh, such a uh, terrible influences on society. So there's a void of leadership when it comes to uh, this particular platform. And we should be re responsible and sensible in what we say, and we should be accountable uh, in what we say and, and what we perpetuate on our social media. And this will basically reduce uh, and prevent uh, violence, uh, uh, going forward and um, tackle this essential issue of uh, gender-based violence. Um, it is also important uh, for young people to be equipped with the tools and expertise to understand root cause of uh, gender-based violence in the community, to also educate and involve uh, fellow peers uh, within the community to work towards preventing such violence. And it also helps uh, young men to be able to uh, know um, that they can also look up to us uh, who are senior to them um, when it comes to support. Um, and also if um, that we hold such an essential role within society, because I've seen it with, even within medical school, now that we're actually in final year, that there are a lot of people that look to us for guidance that look to us for leadership and our actions um, speak louder than our words. So whatever we do, there are people that are observing uh, what we do and what we say. And with that in mind, uh, we should try by all means to eradicate uh, the pandemic of gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Yanga, for those valuable and realistic points. Um, despite how rampant this problem is, I do still have hope that um, our generation will be the one to make significant progress in eradicating this social ill. Um, do any of our speakers have uh, uh, additional pointers for any of the subtopics that have already been um, presented. Hi, Kiara. Um, thank you so much for opening up the floor to us. Um, so I don't um, have additional points, but um, there is uh, um, a few points that our panelists have mentioned, um, you know, that I would just like to, to highlight once again. Um, Okay, so in terms of um, public health and where leadership comes in in public health, Ashik mentioned it so well in that um, it is adaptive and it is innovative and it is the ability of leaders to break new ground. And I think that's so uh, important that we recognize that right now, because often when we are in a degree or, you know, we are even in the working environment itself, it becomes a very rigid, non-flexible process where we are just following protocol. So having this ability to be adaptive, to find new solutions um, you know, to problems that are arising, it, it really is something that is so needed um, in leadership. We need to always um, keep our minds open and you know, just welcome new possibilities, be able to uh, try new things. And I think that is how we are going to move forward in public health and medicine and, you know, in any career at large. So, so that was absolutely um, excellent. And, um, and just a few other comments. Um, 
Tumi had so uh, beautifully mentioned that in terms of spirituality um, and leadership, that um, spirituality isn't religion. And I think for us, um, that's so important to remember. And Tumi, you said it perfectly when you said that spirituality gives us an underlying sense of purpose. It adds meaning to everything that we are doing. And so this spirituality is simply our connection uh, with humanity and with God, if that's what we believe. But it is not um, you know, solely religious practice. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. And um, just another point on what Ravona mentioned to us, um, you know, in terms of human values, um, you know, in, in our degree. And I think it, it was so beautifully said, um, you know, uh, that in terms of the heart set domain, uh, kindness is really just the underlying um, value in everything. And the ability to be empathetic can add that little value to, to a patient's life in, in you know, what could be um, the lowest point of their life. And that really just, uh, you know, gives us this like, uh, re reflective uh, point because we take that for granted because we see so many patients a day we don't realize that we are the doctor that that one patient is seeing and it's not just that one patient that's having the problem it's the whole family that's going through the problem with that patient and so how we receive a patient or a client or anyone has such a profound impact on their life so thank you so much uh, you know for sharing that with us Ravona. Um, sorry, Kiara, I just have another point in terms of what um, Kuriswan mentioned to us that, um, you know, in terms of female leadership, you know, it's absolutely important to continue the work that has been started. And um, most importantly, to stand up and be confident to say what we believe in. So that is important because often we are afraid of the judgment we will receive, especially, you know, in this technological era of social media, we are often afraid to be judged. Um, so we need to develop the confidence to stand for change, to stand for what we believe in. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. And finally, my last point on what, um, you know, Yanga has actually mentioned in terms of gender based violence is that it all stops that are seeing the violence it was exceptionally well said younger because um you know it's how we raise children and you know as as the man or the male figure in a child's life you need to become the example set the example and when you see sexism um you know being implemented you are able to stop it you are stopping that cycle and that was just absolutely brilliant i'm so um honored to be here today and you know i've gained such useful insights from all of you so thank you so much thank you Kara. I'm not sure if there's anyone else that you know wants to highlight anything or just reiterate anything that we've said. Okay, hi, hi. Um, um, I have something to say to add actually in terms of um, leadership. Um, I think we are so focused into like empowering people or young women into getting into leadership. But I think there's also an aspect that is very important, like the mental health in terms of leadership. Like there's a lot that we burden in terms of leadership. There's a lot of things that we go through. And I want to say to young women who are pursuing their career in leadership to say, it's okay to like slow down, slow down, take a breather. It's just okay because um, there's a lot of things that we have to deal with. Um, there's a lot of emotional, physical stresses. And we as medical students, we know that we, uh, we are there in hospital for the longest hours. We have intake, you have social life, and sometimes you end up not having a social life. And when you are in leadership, I feel like there are a lot of things that we forget about in terms of social life. So it's very important to settle down, take a breather, take a minute, 
breathing and then you go back and when you go back you'll be very much energized i think that's a, a, a one of the aspects i forgot to mention earlier on thank you Thank you so much for sharing that, Lisa. I think um, it was we could not actually conclude this uh, webinar today without bringing up, um, you know, the mental health um, impact of this. Because um, yes, leadership can become overwhelming. Just you know, in any degree or in life in general, you know, it can it can definitely get overwhelming. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I think prioritizing our mental well-being should always come first. Okay, thanks, Tavana and um, Poliswa. I'm just going to check the um, Q&A section and the chat to see if we have any questions um, or comments. Um, okay, so David has commented, a powerful discussion. Thanks to all the panelists and organizers. Okay, so I don't see any questions. I'm not sure if there's anyone else to add anything on or has any questions or anything that they would like to add. Any closing remarks? All right. Um, I think, uh, Chiara, we can hand over back to you just to close today's mm -hmm. session. Okay, okay, so that um, concludes this discussion. Um, I'd like to express sincere gratitude to all of our speakers for taking the time out of their busy schedules to share their insights and wisdom. It certainly was a stimulating conversation. May all of you continue to grow from strength to strength and uplift others as you rise. A special thank you to Professor Busisiwe Nkama, as well as Mary Ann Francis and her team for all their work behind the scenes in ensuring the success of this webinar. And lastly, thank you to every single one of you in attendance. It really was a pleasure having you and being your host. I hope you leave feeling inspired and motivated to start or continue your own leadership journey, one that will reform South African healthcare and society at large. So with that being said, have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.